Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, as the case might be. Welcome or welcome back, again, as the case might be. Uh, my name is Dalibor Petrovic. I'm a partner at Deloitte, um, and I have a distinct pleasure of leading Deloitte's uh, executive tech executive program in Canada. Uh, over the past number of years, I've had a pleasure of hosting this particular series of live webcasts where we have explored relevant topics to technology leaders and interviewed some of the most senior technology executives in our country. Today, though, is a very special day. Today, we are using this particular live webcast to formally launch Deloitte's Tech Trends 2024. This is our premier global publication where we're going to explore what we believe is now and what we believe is next in terms of enterprise technologies. Uh, this is a live session, and I would invite you to submit your questions to me and my guest using the Q&A function of this Zoom platform if you'd like to engage, if you'd like to ask any, any of the questions. With that, I am very privileged and delighted to welcome back uh, my colleague, my friend, um, a brother from another mother, Michael <laughs> Bechtel. Mike, thank you so very much for, for coming back to the show. Oh, Dalibor, it, thanks for having me, man. This is a literal treat, and uh, <laughs> that that we're making this this a habit uh, makes it makes it even more so. Thank, thanks for we, having me, sir. We sure are. We sure are. And uh, for the audience members, uh, Mike Bechtel has the coolest title amongst the four hundred and fifty-seven thousand <laughs> Deloiters. Uh, Mike is our global chief futurist. Um, which also makes him the, the chief editor of our global tech trends publications and, and other global tech research. Uh, Mike, this show is all about what's coming in our, in our tech trends publication. I'm yeah. very much looking forward to hearing the story from you. Um, um, welcome, thank you, and over to you, Mike. Well, Dalibor, um, again, thanks, buddy, and... And uh, to those of you who've joined, thanks thanks for making this time. Um, wh when I uh, put out put out the uh, the net this morning for for folks, uh, sort of a last minute invite, if you would, I said, you know, I, I can't guarantee this will be the most urgent part of your day. It, it it might not even be the most important part of your day. Probably won't. But um, but we'd posit that it might be the most interesting. Mm. And so we're grateful for your willingness to a uh, step out of the 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 mayhem of the now and spend a little bit of time um, thinking about what's new and what's next. Now, now that said, let me go ahead and get the old screen share stuff cooking here. Uh, Dalibor, can you see? Yep. The I can see it and it's moving. <laughs> amazing. Yes. The, the, the highly produced thoughtfully rendered visualization of our six macro technology forces more on that in a bit. But, but folks, you know, one of the first things I would tell you, right, it, both as a rebaseline for some of our, our regular attendees, but, but it, as an important baseline for those of you who, who might just be getting to know Deloitte and our approach to tech trends, is that we've been at this for 15 years now. And, and we don't share that as a, <coughs> pardon me, uh, getting, getting over a cold. We don't share that as as a boast. It's not a um, you know a, a a a pat on the shoulder. Trust us, we're professionals, or anything like that. It's a recognition that there's a right way and a wrong way to think about emerging tech and about the future writ large. And um, here's the wrong way. Some of you might remember this this uh, this this film. It's about I don't know eight years old now. It's called Arrival, and yeah. you know this alien species comes down from the heavens, and and um, humanity doesn't know whether to fear it or revere it because because it's so different. And I would tell you that as a geek, that's how it's felt to me watching my clients, both technical and non technical alike respond to generative AI, right? This idea that 
oh my goodness, it's come down from the skies. It's, 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 it's unprecedented. And take it from somebody who's been up to his eyeballs and all things newfangled for, for a quarter century, which, you know, <laughs> puts it up, you know, I'm a little closer to geezer than geek these days, but, <laughs> but generative AI is not unprecedented, right? For, for those who've been part of our, our tech trends research for a few years, you'll know that we believe that futurists are secretly historians yeah. and that the history of technology emergence is just that it's a history. There are patterns and precedents to this stuff everywhere. You know, there's that great quote um, that, that every sufficiently uh, sophisticated technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, let's get rid of the magical thinking and start thinking about history. Mm -hmm. Now, I won't belabor again for 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 those of you who've who've seen this show before. I'm not going to be you know asking you what's this thing? It's the first computer and all that. But what I will tell you is a couple of years back, my team and I did some work with the World Economic Forum wherein we demonstrated that the whole honking history of information technology, and specifically the subset of information technology emergence that helps our clients save or make money, yeah. has been a series of evolutions, not random revolutions, and specifically evolutions along these three tracks, right? Human-computer interaction, it's only ever gotten simpler over the last 200 years. The technology under the hood gets more complex, for sure, so that the user experiences can get simpler. Simpler is a winning horse. Simpler typically wins. On the information front, right? Insights, data, knowledge. I was at a chief data analytics officer uh, leadership academy down at our Deloitte University just yesterday. And I'll tell you, uh, Folks who've been managing data for a while will tell you, yeah, the, these systems keep on getting more intelligent and AI isn't new. It's just sort of what's next in information management. Okay. So simpler, smarter, and then on the compute front, stronger, right? The idea that thanks to Moore's law and miniaturization, a little bit more recently, cloud and virtualization, and a little more recently still, Distributed compute, blockchain, right? And sort of decentralization. We always find ways to do more with less. And so with this in tow, what we're able to do is say, okay, armed with precedent, right? We have trajectories, we have end games, and we can say, we know the stuff that matters is going to be, generally speaking, simpler, smoother, and stronger. But we also know as, as Deloitte, that our household name clients can't simply, you know, like 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 two gals in a garage, you know, whiteboard up some 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 harebrained scheme and raise themselves a couple million bucks to change the world because they're they're carrying a legacy to protect, right? When when you're rooted in the present, you can't just tear it up and jump into the cool new stuff. You got to worry about culture, people, finance, what we call the business of technology. You got to worry about cyber risk and trust. The, the sad fact that there's, there's baddies out there to, to do us harm. And then core modernization. You know, I, I, Dalibor, I regularly have clients will say like, this, this is so supposed to be on the future. It's definitionally old. And I say, yeah, because you you can't get to that future unless you drag your existing kit forward, right? Right. Foundations matter. And so this mix of, of elevating forces and grounding forces of waves of change and waves of adult, yeah. right? this is the stuff that has mattered. We've seen for 15 years, this is the stuff where bread gets buttered, right? And value is created. And with this year's tech trends, <coughs> pardon me, we see that there is something new and compelling in each one. And so, 
Dollab or any questions, comments, concerns, or builds before we jump into what's new and next in tech for each of these six flavors. What you have described here is a very, very simple and compelling model that I would encourage all technology leaders to sort of think through. Those three elements that provide solid foundation that you have to get right and pay attention to uh, as grounding forces yep. in order to en enable you to actually be successful exploring those innovations at the top. So I think that's actually really successfully crafted, simple model. One can use that model to develop the tech strategy, right? That that could be the way to think about tech, tech, full tech portfolio in your enterprise. The second thing that I would mention is that for our audiences, this session is going to cover all tech trends in a sort of an, an executive summary level. But Mike, we are planning six additional live webcast sessions that will come up every two weeks from now where we are going to do deeper dive into each one of those six. So for the audience members who are listening in, if you have particular curiosity for you and for your teams, for your supervisors or your peers, you will have an opportunity to dial in, log in, join us for deep dives for each one of the six trends that we are now going to uh, peek into. Yeah. No, thank, thank you, Dalibor, for, for both the platform to get to get crunchy on each of the six, but also for the um the the kind words on the framework, you know, um, it, it's not like it's not like we knew this stuff 15 years ago, right? It was you know there there were a, a couple of confirmations, but also some negative role models in there that helped us realize what didn't really move that needle. And so, yeah. um, as I like to say, you're either learning or earning, and uh, <laughs> we we we've done a fair amount of uh, learning on the way to helping helping mm. our clients. Um, profit from this framework. So, so here's the scoop, y'all. Jumping right in on the human interaction front, right? On the interface front. The story this year is a story that we're calling interfaces in new places. And here's the idea. Okay. Think of these little blue, these little blue abstract images. Think of them like pixels. We have recognized over the last couple of years that we're reaching a saturation point for screens, for 16 by nine pixel bed rectangles in our lives, right? I was with some clients last week. I said, how many of y'all have a phone? Everybody raise their hand. How many people have two phones? Half the room raises their hand, right? You know, church and state, work and home. It's a lot. And it's not only a lot cognitively, to keep track of. It's a lot because uh, environmentally, sustainably, um, you know, how much of our lived environment becomes a, 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 a touchscreen before, you know, we say enough is enough. Well, what we're started to see, and we've been chronicling this over the last couple of years, but, but here's the, here's the rub with the arrival just last week, for instance, right. Of the Apple vision pro. There's a recognition that rather than building screens all over the place, we can paint pixels where they're needed over our visual field on increasingly manageable headsets, right? You go from a toaster on your face to a ski goggles on your face to a pair of good looking sunglasses, eventually to a contact lens, right? That's mm -hmm. the trajectory. Yeah. But here's what we've learned this year that I think is so interesting, Del. What, what we're starting to see is that contrary to the image I just showed of a white collar professional sitting at a desk with tons of screens around him, that in fact, the traction, the utility, the early emerging workplace use case are what we're calling the two blue collar workforces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's what I mean by that. Consider Hyundai. Right, Hyundai Motor, um, car manufacturer. We spoke to their technology leadership. They said, listen, the executives in offices, fingers on keyboards, screens in front, microphone, 4K camera. The move for that crowd to a, <coughs> pardon me, augmented reality or virtual reality experience. It's material, but it's, you know, 
it's incremental. But the move from the warehouse professionals, the factory floor professionals, the, 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 the actual automakers, the move from them to augmented virtual reality, it's a step change. Yeah. It's, a, it's a zero to one flip because this is a group of folks who haven't been hands on keyboards, screens, cameras, mics, because they've been sold tablets, phones, laptops for, for a generation and generally say, yeah, no, thanks. I'm good. Cause I don't want to be distracted and hit by a forklift. No. No. And so what's interesting is that whether it's folks at Hyundai, the, the line that stuck with me was uh, let's get this set up correct in pixels before we pour concrete, right? whether it's that notion, right? Uh, people on oil rigs, right? People, people in warehouse environments. These are people with busy hands who can't be bothered with gadgets. And so here comes augmented virtual reality as a save. Now on the flip side, there's, there's this idea we're kind of casually calling the other blue collar workforce, doctors, dentists, surgeons, health professionals, right? Clinicians. Why? Because same deal, different context. If you're a doc, right? In this hyper-scheduled world, the last thing you want to do is minimize your very limited patient contact time by looking down at a gadget. And so imagine a world where a surgeon can measure twice before they cut once, where a doc can get need-to-know information over a pair of smart glasses before and during their heart-to-heart conversation with the patient. The yeah. takeaway here, Dalibor, and I, and I think it's it's counterintuitive, but but the client conversations bear it out is that the reason we white collar, hands-on keyboard professionals tend to underestimate the transformative movement of AR is because right now it's not really for us, uh-huh. right? It's for these other busy handed extremes who haven't been able to enjoy digital transformation quite to the level that frankly, most of us on this webinar, I take for granted. Mm-hmm. This but, is what, actually a fascinating insight. This is, you're right, this is very counterintuitive. One would say, one would think that, you know, VR, AR would be most compelling cases for technologists, for example, who are otherwise on keyboards. But what you're saying actually is, no, no, no. The actual use cases we see are really industrial. Industrial, medicine, people who actually, maybe we should say it, people who actually need their hands free to do work, right? Instead That's of right. using their hands to swipe on things. That's it. That's it. You know, I, I spoke with a, you know, and it's a term that that oil rig professionals use, right? They call themselves roughnecks. You know, I was speaking to a guy. He's just like, yeah, you know, I've, uh, I, there's been a tablet available to me for 15 years, but I'd rather not fall off the oil rig. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. and so, you know, here comes, I think here comes a, like any meaningful technology move. It's not a hammer looking for a nail. It's an itch in need of scratching. It's a lead with need story. And uh, it, it's happening quietly everywhere, but those of us writing think pieces, right? Wow. So, so number two, right? I kind of opened with, with this, a little nod to this one, right? You know, part of tech trends is this recognition that there's a panoply of things that matter, right? And that you need to mix the shine with the substance. But I have to tell you, Dalibor, and dear guests, 25 years in emerging tech, I've never seen something grab the attention like Gen AI. Yeah. I mean, I've seen a lot of waves, right? I've seen, you know, internet of things, big data, blockchain, metaverse, you name it. There's always a thing, right? And people run to the thing like six-year-olds mobbing a soccer ball. And it's a bad time, right? That's not the way to do it. We've established that. But what I would tell you is, <laughs> pardon me it's still a critical wave of change, right? There's a tendency, if you don't fall in love with something, then you feel compelled to fall in, in hate with something. <laughs> and, 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 and neither one is right. Generative AI should be thought of in the context of these simpler interactions, this more performing compute and all of the adulting on the bottom row. Let's tell you what we're seeing. For starters, what we're seeing is that 
generative AI properly conceived as part of a proper enterprise strategy is a growth catalyst. Okay, that that might be the most consulting speak thing that I've said so far and that I hope to say all, all, all meeting. But here's what I mean. There's a tendency to think about all of this as like robots versus people, about disruption, displacement, change, transformation. Um, in truth, properly conceived and properly employed at our leading clients, what we're seeing is that this stuff is helping with strategic growth agendas, full stop. Let me give you some examples. For starters, you know, the data bears out the feeling, I think many of us are feeling that, whoa, this thing came in hot. And I could see why you'd think it was unprecedented, right? We weren't hearing anything about this until about 14 months ago, and that's all we're hearing about. Well, sure. But now that the, the random acts of digital are starting to subside, now that the endless think pieces about what does it all mean are starting to give way to meaningful implementations, what we're starting to see is that our clients are beginning to use that precedented nature of alts as a means to separate wheat from chaff and get to real value. So let me give you a couple examples. Shutterstock. Shutterstock is a stock photography company. Many of you've probably heard of, maybe many of you have used before. In speaking with their technology leaders, their business leaders, they said, listen, we know that in a world where you can ask to create an image, that you'd be a little less inclined to dig up an existing paid professional photography image. Mm -hmm. And rather than throw their hands up and you know mm -hmm. decry disruption, they got busy building a really clever solution. They said, listen, we're gonna train our own image diffusion model on the corpus of pictures that make up our Shutterstock library. Mm -hmm. but, but here's where it gets really nuanced and interesting. Realizing that this model is standing on the shoulder of human giants, they pay those photographers an annuity payment as a recognition and reward for being the basis on which that mechanical sort of magic stands. Oh, that's and, so cool. Right. Right? That is so and cool. It's so cool. And Dalibor, I mean, one of the many things I love about you, right, is the way you, you frame yourself, right? An optimist, a technologist. There it is, folks. An optimistic, trust-based use of technology that says, listen, um, let's not celebrate the machine. Let's celebrate the people yeah. who trained a best-in-class machine. Yes. And, and by the way, I'm sure and protect the intellectual property or, or re redefine how to think about intellectual property. What a great, what a great yeah. innovative application of this technology. Fantastic story. And yes. by the way, what, what image it immediately comes to mind, obviously, I mean, music, art, yep. other things, right? Yep. Yep. Very, very that's cool. It. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It, it, it's early days, to put it mildly. Right? Yeah. We're, as, as I had a client say to me yesterday, we're at the Beanie Baby era. Like what Beanie <laughs> Babies were to the internet, like that. this is where we are with Gen AI. But, awesome. but you're starting to realize that, that ethics and business and trust will find a way if we as leaders prioritize it, right? Now, yeah. Eastman, I love this example. Eastman Chemical in good old Kingsport, Tennessee, talking with their CIO. <laughs> he says, listen, our B2B sales professionals have had that classic, you know, this call may be recorded for customer improvement or, you know, however that, that, you know, phrase goes. Um, he said, we've had 10 years of customer discussion transcripts and, you know, KPIs saved off to a cloud-based disk. But, but like that scene in, in Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I'm dating myself, but Remember the warehouse Dalibor where the Ark of the Covenant gets stuck and of course nobody's the, gonna the find final it. Thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that you know, that that sounds a lot like a lot of people's enterprise data. It's like, yeah, we saved it because disk is cheap, but uh, I don't know how we're gonna use it. Well, Eastman brilliantly, they said, you know what? 
let's go ahead and put an LLM against that corpus, against all of that text. Why? So that their sales pros can sit down during a call and as somebody, you know, cites an objection on the pricing of a window tinting screen or, you know, whatever, whatever they're, they're, you know, transacting, they can interact with that warehouse of 10 years of knowledge as a sales guide on the side. <laughs> and, and what's so cool about that is it's like, yeah, no, we had the data. It's just that we put a, a, a cheap and cheerful front end on it that allows us to ask, oh, what, what should I do now? What might I consider? And, you know, it's in the pilot stage. But to me, it, it, it was this great example of, it's not that they came running around saying, what are we going to do with an LLM? Rather, they said, you know, we've got this great data and our salespeople could use some help overcoming objections. How about an LLM? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, this, 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 these stories are actually making it real. And what I like about those is that these are actually truly novel, unusual, and brilliant use cases. I think that, you know, that there are there are use cases that are very obvious, like chat bots and and creation of reports and and you know creation of essays and and emails. That everybody knows about that. Everybody, I think, is aware of those use. Cases. But what you shared now, this is pretty novel and cool. Uh, great. Well, in in Dalibor, I you know it, you know I'll, I'll slip you five dollars for an amazing setup for my next point. Thanks for the segue, brother. Because because here's the thing. Um, with respect, the, the use case inventory stuff, the, 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 your idea, but at my org, like that's low hanging fruit and that's interesting, but what we're actually finding is that, and we've hit this note, right? This is a tech evolution, but a business revolution. Great. But that, that creative people and creative human ideas matter more, not less in this era. Mm -hmm of generative machines. Yeah. Let me give you let me give you two quick examples here and you're going to notice folks that the, the 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 visual energy in this presentation changes dramatically because we just went from our professional design team to you know me slinging powerpoint may yeah. may you know mercy on everybody's soul on this one but but here's the idea. You know <clears throat> I was speaking with a toy maker that you can figure out through this this picture right and they 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 drew my attention to this third party app that would scan okay let me reshow that for everybody it would it would scan visually with your phone every brick in your pile and show you every conceivable toy you could make and 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 I asked him I said are are you worried about that like from an IP or from a you know just sort of a a fair use standpoint and they said no we love it and I said tell me more and you know, I'll, I'll I'll share the story through my own lived experience. This is my son Benny, right? He's eight in this picture. He's eleven now, so he's like you know thirty percent less adorable. But he's still cute. <laughs> but but here's the thing: when I sit down with Bennett to to build to build bricks, right? Yeah, we're ostensibly there to build cool stuff. But what are we really there to do? We're there to make memories. The thing is. We spend all this time hunting and pecking for little pieces. And if you're honest, you spend too much time doing that. Well, in my conversation with the, 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 the toy executive, he said, let's continue the, the thought experiment. You know, to, to make those memories, you also got to make some bricks. And to make the bricks, you got to find some petroleum. But we don't think about that stuff, right? Because, because that's some other company's problem, right? There, there's externalities all the way down and, you know, well, the point was this, <laughs> that Boom. AI tool, right? That AI tool kind of, what it's doing is it's raising the waterline yes. so that we can spend more time doing the good stuff. Beautiful. Right? And in Dalibor, I, I was in Malta, which you don't hear that every day. I mean, my, first time for everything. And uh, I, it's beautiful. Highly recommend it. Just don't all go at once because it's very small. But- I was with the Maltese business community a couple of weeks ago. And this, this, <laughs> this leader said, this is interesting, but we do not make toy bricks. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, hey, Maltese business community, I don't know what y'all are doing specifically, but my guess is you're all out to drive profitable growth by differentiated products and services. Yeah. 
And so you're accustomed to the cloud companies taking the back office off your hands and the CRM ERP taking the front office off. And here comes AI to take administrivia and pain in the butt bookkeeping, right? And here comes Gen AI to further raise that water line. <laughs> and what was interesting, Dalibor, is we got into a really, a really rich discussion about how it's not going to do it entirely. That in in the same way that that Tony, you know, I I I, I forget the term, right? Like like billionaire genius playboy, right? Like you know, yeah. he's got a lot going for him. Yeah. But Tony in the super suit, wow, that's really something. And so what we're finding is that for any of this Gen AI stuff to be worth a lick, we want to make sure that it's in the hands of our geniuses. It's in the hands of our best people. It's in the hands of our most generative folks. And just a, a brief anecdote on this one, and then we, you know, four, four more trends to visit. But if this equation notionally captures the energy, right? That it's humans raised to the power of this machine force multiplier. The best example I've got, <laughs> tell it where I'm at our Deloitte University in, in, in Dallas. I'm showing literal captains of industry, CFOs, some that you've seen on television. Yeah. These tools. And, and I was showing him an image diffusion model. It's about a year ago. And I said, gang, you can ask it for anything you want. What do you want to see? You're literally limited only by your imagination. This sort of arms crossed individual, he goes, show me a sunset. And the whole room kind of like deflates, like that's all you got? Yeah. And the picture that that diffuses, that renders, right? Yeah, you know, it's a sunset and it's okay. But so interestingly, Dalibor, he 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 looks at this 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 projection of his own imagination. He goes, "It's just a sunset." And I remember thinking, like, yeah, because you know, you you know, you kind of ask you ask for you ask for meh, and you get kind of meh. Yeah. His chief of staff, this this young woman leader, kind of bursts into the circle, and she goes, "I want to see potato chips versus pretzels in a fight." And uh, potato chips get nunchucks, pretzels get squirt guns. Whole thing's on Mars. The whole thing is on Mars? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And these captains Whoa. of industry are all looking at her like, A, you're nuts. B, I love it. Yeah. And then C, as the picture renders, business leaders start to clap, including Grumpy Sunset Guy. <laughs> oh, and that's so cool. I mean, but 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 here's here's why, it, and I agree with it, 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 it. But but here for those of you who are like, yeah, but but we don't make um, potato chip pictures. Right? I get it. The the punchline for business team is we geeks are familiar with this term garbage in, garbage out. What we're seeing with generative AI is it's huh. elevating. It's garbage in, garbage squared. Right? Give it bad data. Give it uninteresting ideas. You're going to get worse bias and yep. even less interesting outcome. But you give it the good stuff, you're going to have a great time. And so spent a little more time on Gen AI to honor the fact that everybody's focused on it. But Dalibor, it, it's a tech evolution, but yeah, it, it means big stuff for business. That That's... Um build out with the raising waterline is uh, I think that every board member of every board should actually see that. And every executive should see that. That I think is a very, very compelling way to describe what have we as humanity tapped into here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, and, and it, you know, will there be disruption and, you know, will everybody be neatly redeployed to the cooler stuff? No, there's, you know, there's, Economy is going to economy, but but I think generally speaking, this this is a continuation in ten thousand years of hacks to work on higher order stuff. What is really inspiring in what you just talked about is that uh, AI not being seen as a threat, but as a force multiplier of humans. Yeah, that yeah. when you have geniuses 
geniuses can be squared, as you say. Yeah. So that is very that that actually is a very uplifting and optimistic way to think about it. And I think this is actually the right way to think. About it. This is the right way to think about it. We got to govern it. I mean, you know, to your point, Deliver, <laughs> sky's the limit. But but yeah, we 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 got to make sure that we we, you know, it, gar garbage squared is still a risk, and so yeah. all of the usual governance tropes apply, and more than ever. Yeah, and and obviously the, the automation part, where where people were sort of first deploying machine learning and AI and automation tools, in this context, those tools are still there to free us up, to free us up, so we can yeah. spend more time. Yeah. Um, multiplying the intelligence of humans, right? That's that good. that's actually very very good. Like it's all fitting together nicely. <laughs> yeah. No. I hey, listen. I I'm I'm here for it. Let's let's build the future we want, right? Yes. So, so team. Okay. Um, right on time. Right. We the, the 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 it was a feature, not a bug, that we spent a little extra on Gen AI because again, it's it's the term du jour, but but there are other colors in this rainbow, literally. Because as we move on to our yellow trend, um, the compute stack, right, the platform that powers this party, it's had a heck of a run, right? You, you typically can't get through a conversation with a, an emerging technologist without hearing about good old Moore's law, right? The idea that machines have and cost double in performance every 18 months <coughs> until they didn't. Because the laws of physics are presenting a manufacturing barrier where you can't just count on things being better, faster, cheaper, stronger in a year and a half. And by proxy, you can't just strategically procrastinate and hope that your bills come down, you know, automatically in the next couple of years. And so cloud, cloud provided a nice reprieve from that hard truth. Right, because cloud brought us this opportunity to sort of move our stuff from our basement to some other company's basement for pennies on the dollars, in the same way that you would move, you know, electrical coal production to the a utility company eighty years ago. Great, but even the cloud value prop is coming under pressure, simply because markets equalize, and everything's not just magically cheaper everywhere once a market hits equilibrium. Oh. And so what, what are we seeing? Well, a little bit geekier, a little bit more back office, but again, this stuff all matters. What we're seeing is that our most pioneering clients are finding that it's about working smarter than harder and getting back to engineering basics. Let me get, let me get really crunchy and specific here. <laughs> it used to be years and years and years ago that, that, that the computer, you know, time on a computer was a precious gift. And so a computer programmer would have to get their code just right before they could log into the central campus computer and, and, and use those sweet, sweet, precious, precious MIPS instructions per second, right? Um, then when bandwidth got cheap and disk got cheap and cloud and the rest of it, what we tended to find was like, ah, you write anything, write it lazily, write it bloated because, you know, it, it, it's all instant. It's all pennies. Well, for the reasons that I just described, what's old is new again. Our clients are finding that ah, when a world where disk and compute isn't quite as cheap, let's write leaner, more elegant code. Let's get back to first principles and figure out how to get more done with less and that could be on-prem compute, but with tidier code. In the case of the state of Utah example, these cats did a good old fashioned refactoring. They took COBOL and they rewrote it from the ground up in Java so that they could get much improved performance on the same machines they already had without having to stroke fresh checks. In the case of Colroot Group in Belgium, it's a heck of a word to pronounce for, for an American, Col Colroot. But these cats basically said, listen, we've got this OT, operational technology network, edge computers, sensors at the edges. Let's tap into that network to help share in distributed workload so that rather than buying servers to do everything, we can use the investments we've already got. 
the high level takeaway for me on this one, Dalibor, is that all of this efficiency and tightening and sort of smarter, not harder work is a prelude to the slow but increasingly sure bet of post-digital computing coming into the fore, quantum computing, neuromorphic, optical computing, entirely new paradigms that use physics instead of math to solve sticky, wicked problems. Until those are ready, we're starting to see a return to that sort of 1970s, 1980s aesthetic of make sure that code is lean, mean, and clean and running in the right place because there ain't no cheap way to sweep it under the rug anymore. Any thoughts on that one, brother, before I keep on trucking? Very, very, this is actually a very common sense practical advice that is really timely for the time that our economies find themselves in, right? Yeah, so for sure. the step, what is now and what is new is let's figure out a way to actually leverage what we have better, smarter. And the added benefit is that by doing that, we are getting ourselves ready for what's coming. And as what I'm hearing you say, what's coming is that we are going to go beyond binary, beyond bits yep. in terms of how we compute. Yep. Um, and, and very likely, in addition to bits, we'll be friends with qubits. We'll be friends <laughs> yeah. with sy synaptic computing and, and photon-based computing as well. And yeah. that, those are... Four, four emerging technologies of which probably quantum will be most well known, but others are on the horizon yeah. as well. The, the, the photon computing, the synapse computing, and the qubits computing. Yeah, it, it's it's going to be a whole new um, a whole new game. And again, yeah. we can make sense of it through that opening lens of, you know, abundance tends to win, right? It, it, you know, mm. to the extent that there are technologies that allow us to do dramatically yeah. more with dramatically less. That's probably worth your time, attention, and wallet share. And if you think about it, uh, like Moore's law has held true for 50 years, but we are coming at the end of what is physically possible, what, what yeah. natural laws allow. And, 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 and funny how it works, funny yeah. how this all works, as if it was a matrix. By the time we are at the edge of what we know, suddenly new things are emerging and it feels like the Moore's law might actually carry on into the future, but just using different ways to yeah. compute. It's a it's a nice way to think about it. I, I um yeah, I, I yeah. Well, well said, right? Somebody, some for me, geek is a celebration. Some geek somewhere is going to get their name on a new law that, yeah. that speaks to post digital computing for sure. So, team, rounding the corner, let let's talk about. Let's talk about three of the more, uh, for lack of better words, the grounding forces, right? The, 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 the trends that we're seeing that, that need to be mindfully minded as we seek to pioneer with the sorts of things we mentioned above. The first, <laughs> and a tip of the hat to our graphic, graphic designers who, who built this righteous sort of, you know, as I cough, you know, I'm thinking bronchial tubes, kind of. But this is a two, this is a trend about humans. This is a trend about people. And very specifically, it's a trend about techies. Hmm. Let me explain. 10 years ago, right, Tech Trends 5, Deloitte talked about this recognition that every company was becoming a technology company. And I remember, you know, and, and super straight talk. I, I wasn't even with Deloitte at the time, but I remember that provocation and I read it and I thought, really? Right? Like even mid Midwestern, mid-market insurance companies? What? And 10 years on, here we are. It's like, yeah, pretty much. Because every company is either tech-centric or tech-fueled, right? What's interesting though here is that by proxy, a knock-on effect of that is that an increasing and fast growing percentage of every company's people are techies, right? Developers, engineers, technologists. But techies tick differently. What we're finding, Dalibor, is that companies, you know, two, three, four years ago, different economy, 
the focus was how do we find these mythical rock star engineers and, and, you know, kings and queens ransom to get them in. But when they're in, they feel hindered. They're like, what do you mean we can't use GitHub? What do you mean we can't use this technology? What do you mean yeah. high performance is rewarded with a raise, which I'll take. But a promotion where I have to hand in the laptop and take a briefcase, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's not tech culture. Developers, developers want interesting problems to solve, autonomy, agency, minimal red tape. And to a traditional organization, that feels like cowboy anarchy. Except pioneering organizations are finding a way to have their cake and eat it too. So for example, Citibank. We talked to tech leaders at Citibank. They said, listen, we've recognized that promotion at Citibank's like 19,000 person technology team. It's not about elevating into becoming a suit and not doing what you love anymore. It's about unlocking an achievement where you have more freedom to work on a wider array of problems, work with a wider collection of teams, sort of breadth as reward rather than height up the proverbial ladder, right? At CarMax, <laughs> rebuilding the incentive and metrics models to focus on frequency of releases and cadence of releases to honor the agile sprint kind of scrum mojo as baked into the performance process rather than have that be the way you live but wonder why something orthogonal to that determines your your, your raise and comp and so the kind of it, it starts with a recognition that techies tick differently but what it grows into, and this is something we're we're sort of working hard to lead lead from the front here with at Deloitte, is we're saying, listen, it, it's it's more than just talent experience. It's it's making sure that you've got the right platform and tools, right? Making sure that folks feel like they're using modern engineering practices, platforms, workbenches, tool chains. It's about making sure that handoffs and team reporting structures are built in a way that's engineer led not sort of legacy bureaucracy led. And so in, in short, Dalibor, it's the elevation of what was called as recently as a few years ago, DevOps, right? The idea that rockstar developers needed other people as supports, right? Operations pros, testers, deployers. It's yeah. saying, no, 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 it's more than just characters, it's culture. Yeah. We need a world-class developer experience because in a world where more techies are, you know, everywhere, um, we need to treat the workforce in a way that recognizes that they operate differently. This is so. This is so important, uh, especially in in the environment where those skills are so um, scarce and yeah. quite frankly short lived. So yeah. you want to create an environment where you can have these these geniuses absolutely anchored to the organization with passion. Because they will maximize their impact and potential and have fun doing it. So I love this concept of, of DevX as the build out to DevOps. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Very, no, very you good. Got it. No, thank you. Um, you know, interestingly, it, it can it can also save you some money, right? Because you know, if, if you've got yeah. a disengaged bunch of people in in a, in a broken culture there's a tendency to, you know, you, you feel like you're overpaying for sadness. And so if you've got engaged, happy campers, it's like, okay, the economics kind of take care of themselves. Right. And those three, three, three things that you met, that you shown <laughs> are really, that's a great model for, for every IT leader, actually business leader to say, okay, if I want to really generate positive developers experience in my organization, here are the things that I need to, like there's nine things to really focus on. Like yeah. it's a finite number of things that really make high impact. So this is very, yeah. very practical again. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, CHROs, take heed. Yeah. Techies matter, right? So bringing it home here, uh, trend five, you know, there's the, the cyber topic, to me, Dalibor, it always feels like, um, like an old spy serial, right? I mean, this is serious stuff, right? I'm not trying to trivialize it, but, you know, in this episode, our intrepid heroes have the momentary upper hand, right? In this year's episode, the bad guys have the upper hand, spy versus spy. Exactly. Well, <laughs> two years ago, two years ago, 
we talked about cyber AI and the idea that in a world of rapidly proliferating baddies, the good folks only hope was robot reinforcements, right? Machine learning algos that could find an outlier in a fraction of a second and seal it off while the human took their time to come over and attend to it and figure out what's going on. And we posited, I'll never forget with our, our dear friend, Scott Buckholz, we said, this is interesting until the baddies have it too. Mm -hmm. Dot, 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 calendar, calendar, calendar. Here we are and gasp, the baddies have it too. Yeah. And specifically, what the bad actors are doing right now with AI is they're creating the next generation of phishing and fakery. And, and long gone, right? Long gone <laughs> is the, you know, the, many people remember it, it referred to as the Nigerian prince emails, right? The, the poorly worded AOL email that would confuse grandma out of a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. We're now talking about a convincing 4K video of Dalibor Petrovich yeah. texting me on, you know, chat, opening up a Zoom and asking to borrow my login. Except it's not you. It's a deep fake. It's it's what we're now calling synthetic media. And so the, the punchline here is that we literally can't trust our eyes and ears anymore. A company called Reality Defender we spoke to, they said, listen, we've had a bingo game on our website with 25 faces. Five are fake, 20 are real. Find the fakes. We'll actually pay you. We'll pay the winner, whoever finds the five fakes. Nobody's ever found it. Because it's that good. They're good, yeah. It's and good. so the punchline is there's a new battlefront of math, testing math, right? Of, <coughs> pardon me, I had one client refer to it as digital truth serum, running every email, every video, every picture, every call through this new world, not of firewalls, but of truth detectors to make sure that the stuff coming in passes muster. Because in a world where we can't trust our eyes and ears, we have to trust the math. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our, our, our cyber uh, colleagues, you know, put together this, this graphic that, that might not render perfectly well on the screen, but the, the, the punchline is the baddies aren't just using single methods of attack. If you take a deep fake and then you run a little prompt injection to misinform somebody as a means of phishing, you get into this Swiss cheese security issue where somebody's going to crack, right? Somebody's going to get through all the holes that are lined up just right. And you're going to have a bad time. And so the takeaway isn't that the baddies have won forever, right? The takeaway is that right here in 2024, synthetic media and truth, right? Our, our synthetic media is making it such that truth and trust are under attack. Mm -hmm. Check back next year when our intrepid good guys start to find means of, um, you know, nipping that one for good. Very, very neat. And and I, I saw the, um, in the actual report, you are calling out a particular example. I think it was with, um, with Intel that they've developed a solution that can actually analyze the blood flow under the skin of the face. Yep. And recognize that, if that is identified, then that is more likely to be an actual human, yeah. Versus that that same individual, but like it's it's going at that level, and it it is reading emails and right. picking up those emails that might be the the construction of words might be too Gen AI like, right? It's only them out to say this this actually might not have been written by a person, yeah, which is outstanding, right? It's. I, I, the least technical term I'll say all day, it's bananas. Yeah, yeah. Because to your point, what a machine can see, like in that Intel example you just mentioned for this picture, you know, that that's not how I look at you. <laughs> and it's yeah. not how a deep fake might represent you. But if you can get to that level below the level, right? Yeah. Uh, or with LLMs, as you said, I, I learned two words this year, burstiness and perplexity as means of divining humanity right? You know, are you really a robot? Are you really a human? It's, um, it's a mad world out there, but yeah. it's just part of the world, right? I, I think one of the things I've learned is that boards, boards of directors 
too often equate technology with cyber risk. That's all they, you know, it's like, what could go wrong? And, and again, back to our model, right? It, it's a piece of the pie, right? But it's just one piece. Yeah. yeah. So bringing us home, gang, uh, a, a quick story quickly told. Too often, core modernization and legacy application renewal feel like going to the dentist. You know, you don't think about it all year long until your reminder comes up, like, oh, I got to go to the dentist. And because you haven't been thinking about it, maybe you haven't been doing the hygiene you ought to be doing. And so the visit is a bad time. And what happens? It makes you like the experience even less. Worst of all, it puts a hole in your wallet because, you know, a root canal is a heck of a lot more expensive than you know, a, a simple plaque removal. Well, yeah. where am I going with this analogy? Where I'm going is that's a lot what it feels like to many organizations, many of our clients as regards core modernization, right? It's not terribly sexy. It's not terribly fun. The few times you look at it tend to involve having to stroke a check to do a massive ERP overhaul or similar. And so the out of sight, out of mind makes it worse, not better. Enter a reframe that we're starting to see at some of our more pioneering clients where they say, listen, <laughs> let's change the whole dynamic around tech debt. Let's stop thinking of it like an annual bad news party. Let's think of it as a piece of daily preventative health in mm -hmm. the same way that a smartwatch gets you thinking about moving enough steps every day. Delibor, in the same way that you know we were talking about uh, psychobehavioral diet apps help you make the right choice at the right time. The point is preventative medicine lowers your medical bill. Preventative technology remediation similarly lowers your modernization bill. And so whether it's Amazon, <coughs> pardon me, building real-time automagical tools that are scanning and looking for micro upgrade opportunities in real time all year long, or in this case, the good old state of Utah again, you know, they, they show up in trends twice, um, saying, listen, we're using ALML bots to surf through our old crusty code to figure mm -hmm. out where are the areas of most need and line them up for bite-sized prioritization. The real punchline is just by reframing this as a daily activity rather than an annual trip to the dentist, you can avoid red lights that over charge you and instead pick things up when they're merely yellow and, and have a better time. Another excellent practical, logical, but brilliant observation. And, and what a great trend. What a great this is this is actually a, a this is a cultural shift that is enabled by modern technology. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and 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 you know and it's also driven by need, brother. Right. I mean, you know, it's hard enough to find techies who want to work on neat stuff, but to find techies who want to work on old, old and busted. I mean, that, you know, we've, we've heard about the aging workforce for years. Um, it needs to be a little part of everybody's job because the people hankering to do this for their full-time gig are, are, you know, fewer and further between every day. And so, you know, with that, um, you know, I would just say, Dalibur, before I hand it over to you, my friend, right here on time. Wait, good job on time management, my friend. But you know, my 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 kids would say like and subscribe, and and so here I am. I would say you know, Dalibor and I do our best to share little field notes. In my case, from the future, and Dalibor's case, from the from the technology leadership suite every day. And so, um, you know, if if a slow drip of this sort of uh, energy is is up your alley go ahead and and, and um, let's connect on linkedin it's always a treat and then the report itself right it's fun to get the 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 performance artist version <laughs> that we just had today but we have a fabulous team of researchers writers designers who who make sure that there is real intellectual heft and crunch and stake underneath all this sizzle and so um do yourself a favor and read the report itself. It it, it puts the uh, the sound and light show to shame. And with that, Dalibor, oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. This was wonderful, Mike. Fantastic. Thank you very much on, on my behalf and behalf of our audience members and those who will watch us on YouTube. We're going to post 
this recording on, on YouTube. Uh, I will invite you to rejoin us in two weeks on February 21st. We're going to start with unpacking each one of the trends in a deep dive. Our first session is going to be around spatial computing and, and uh, trend number one. Um, so please join us. Um, I've had a pleasure to read the actual report. I printed it in a very sort of old fashioned style and had a yellow marker to highlight the things. And I ended up highlighting it all. So I had to reprint it again <laughs> because every paragraph, there was something to highlight on every paragraph. It was magnificent. I want oh, to wow. thank you and the team for creating that. So uh, Mike, with that, thank you so very much. Thank you, audience. We did receive a number of questions. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but we're going to do our best to follow up with those questions. 100%. Uh, thank you very much. Have yourself a lovely Wednesday. And I hope to see you all in a couple of weeks for our first deep dive. Thank you and good day.